So I'm really excited to be doing this. I think this is my first uh, virtual talk, so to say. So when I was going through previous talks to get an idea of what people are talking about, what people are interested in, I saw a lot of um, talks based on the science that comes out of HPC and all the amazing results and um, data that's getting collected. But I didn't see too much about what does a HPC environment actually look like? So what are the different pieces that go into putting a big HPC environment together? So since I work in the operations group, I figured I, that would be a good idea for me to do that, to just talk about what are the different pieces that make up a HPC environment and how do you create a sustainable operating HPC environment? So having said that, let me talk about Nix first. So where I'm from. So Nix is the National Institute for Computational Sciences. And it's a joint effort between the University of Tennessee and the Oak Ridge National Lab, which is a, dep a U.S. Department of Energy uh, facility. So we were established in 2007. So we're one of the newest centers in the U.S. And our initial claim to fame was we deployed the first academic uh, petaflop supercomputer, which was called Kraken back in 2009. Uh, since then, we've worked with about over 8,000 users from about 900 institutions from across the country and across the world. Uh, we've run about over 6 million jobs and delivered over 4.2 billion core hours since uh, 2009. So we're kind of proud of the work we do here. So what am I going to be talking about today? Um, the first thing is I'm going to cover what are the basic parts that make up a HPC environment. Uh, then do a little deeper dive into all of these. Uh, talk about the storage architectures, and then the infrastructure elements. Um, so talk about network security and the cluster infrastructure itself. Uh, what are the kind of tools we use to manage a network uh, setup from a security point of view? Because often you hear that network and security go hand in hand. They work very, very closely together. So what are the tools that we use to manage these things? Um, authentication mechanisms, how do we allow users on our systems? Because that's another big, uh, it could be a very big security hole if done wrong. And I would, with a special focus on two-factor or multi-factor authentication. Uh, then a little bit about accounts and account management. How do we manage our users? How do we manage their time on our resources? Um, a little bit more about monitoring and reporting. How do we monitor our systems? How do we know what's going on? How do we know when things have failed? Um, how do we report our use to um, the National Science Foundation, let's say, who provides a lot of our funding? What kind of reporting do we do to our users? Because they would like to know how they have used the machines, et cetera. Um, then finally, I'd also like to talk a little bit about configuration management, about what we do regarding that here at Nix, Because that's the kind of main glue that ties up all these pieces together and makes it work in a cohesive, flowing way. And finally, a little bit about the other tools that make the life of a system administrator a little easier. I don't think I could ever say that a system administrator's life is easy, but these things make life a little less, a little more fun. Um, so what are the main components of a HPC environment? So at the center of it all, you have the cluster or a supercomputer. And around it, there are these five main pieces, I think. So you have the storage. And when you talk about storage, you have users, home areas, you have the scratch file system, you have archival storage. And then we have network and operational security. And the third main piece is infrastructure, where you have your LDAP, you have your DNS, DHCP, uh, mail servers, all your infrastructure servers, basically. And then you have the software stack, and these are kind of divided into two parts. On one side, you have the application software that users use. So in that, you have your uh, CFD software, you have your biosciences software, uh, your chemistry packages, all of that. But on the other side, you also have administrative software. So in terms of monitoring, what are the kind of mo monitoring tools we use? What are the kind of reporting tools we use? Um, a little bit, I will talk uh, in a little bit about that going forward. And then finally, the, the last piece I'd like to talk about is account and account management and authentication and what kind of uh, tools we use on our systems here. Um, so let's quickly go through the logical view of a HPC environment. 
So right on top, you have the users and the public interface. And that's basically the World Wide Web right out there. So anybody from outside who wants to connect to our network comes in through this public interface. So the first thing they're going to hit are our login nodes. And those are the only pieces of our environment that are out available to the outside world. Um, so once you come in through the login nodes, you are put onto a private network within the cluster environment. This is basically to shield the insides of the cluster and the environment from any malicious forces on the outside. So on, from the private network, you can access your home areas, you can access your archival storage, you can also access the parallel file system. And of course, where your jobs run, the compute nodes. Um, so the next thing, storage itself. So like I said earlier, uh, three main types of storage that we have here. First is home space. Um, then that's home space is basically where users are going to um, house their code, compile their code, things like that. Uh, user scratch space is basically attached to the compute nodes and that is used as temporary scratch area uh, for output that happens when a job runs. And if the job needs a little scratch area before, during the processing of the job, that's the space that it gets. Um, but like I said, it's scratch space, so it's not guaranteed storage. If you need to save the data that you're getting from a job run, either move it back to your home or to the third thing that I'm going to talk about, which is archival storage. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about home areas and what we use for home areas here at Nix. So we use NFS, which is network file systems, and I think that is predominantly used across clusters across uh, the country and elsewhere. Uh, so it was developed by Sun Microsystems in 1984. Uh, it allows for remote for hosts to mount file systems remotely over a network and interact with those file systems as though they mounted locally. So this really helps out the system administrator because instead of mounting or creating a file, syst file system on every single node or a logger node, computer node, et cetera, you can just create this remotely. It saves on space and you mount it locally on every single node. So as I said earlier, it commonly contains users' home directories and software directories, and can also be used for project directories where a group can collaborate. So in a lot of instances, it's just not a single person working on a piece of code or um, project. You have multiple people working on the same project together. So in this case, we create project directories for that entire group. So that way they get to share, they can set group permissions where they can share the data between themselves, but it's not uh, accessible to users outside their group. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about are parallel file systems. Um, so in our case, we use Luster. So it's a type of parallel distributed high-performance file system that's generally used for large-scale cluster computing. Uh, it's scalable and can be a part of multiple clusters and can range from a few terabytes to petabytes in storage. Uh, what's nice about this is that it can be mounted across uh, clusters. So in our case, we have a 1.3 petabyte file system at Nix, and this is a site-wide file system. So it's just not mounted on one machine. We have it mounted across multiple clusters that we have. So a little fun tip is a Luster is basically a conglomeration of the words Linux and cluster, and therefore you get Luster. So a little bit of the history of Luster. It started out in 1999 as a research project at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, the lead developer on it left CMU to start his own um, corporation called Cluster File Systems in 2001. Uh, then the U.S. Department of Energy picked it up for a little bit, and it got funded uh, through them and the, as a collaborative project with the, the DOE and with HP and Intel. And in 2007, uh, Cluster File Systems was acquired by Sun Microsystems which was then in 2010 acquired by Oracle. And since they acquired, since um, Cluster File Systems was a part of Sun, they acquired um, the rights to manage and distribute Luster. But somewhere around 2010, um, Oracle announced it was going to stop the development of Luster. So what happened was it gave way to several um, competitors, let's say, to develop and package their own uh, Luster-like systems. So that's what came to the rise of things like open scalable file systems, that's OpenSFS, uh, WAM Cloud, Zyrotex, to name a few. So what are the four, I think there are four main components that make up a, a Luster file system. So they are the object storage targets or the OSDs, 
the object storage servers, the OSSs, the metadata servers, that's MDS, and the metadata targets, which are MDTs. Um, object storage targets, let me talk a little bit about that. So the OST may be thought of as a virtual disk, though it often consists of several physical disks in a RAID configuration, for instance. User file data is stored in one or more objects, with each object stored on a separate OST. The number of objects per file is user configurable and can be tuned to optimize performance for a given workload. Um, the next thing is the object storage servers, or the OSSs. They manage a small set of the OSTs by controlling IO access and handling network requests to these OSTs. So OSSs can contain some kind of metadata about the files that's stored on the OSTs. They typically serve between two to eight OSTs per OSS. Uh, the next thing is the metadata server. So that is a single service node that assigns and tracks all of the storage locations associated with each file in order to direct file IO requests to the correct set of OSTs and corresponding OSSs. So that's because a file, especially if it's a large file, can be striped across multiple OSTs. Um, that's for just for high performance because the Luster file system is a high performance file system. So to increase performance, you try to stripe it across multiple disks. Uh, finally, the metadata targets store metadata such as file names, uh, directories, permissions, file layouts, etc., on a storage attached to the MDS. Storing this metadata on an MDT provides an efficient division of labor between computing and storage resources. So each file on the MDT contains the layout of the associated data file, including the OST number and the object identifier, and points to one or more objects associated with this data file. Um, so what does a typical Luster layout look like, and how does uh, Luster actually work? So when a compute node needs to create or access a file, it requests the storage locations from the MDS and the associated MDTs. So you have your Luster clients that are running on any node that actually mounts Luster. So these are the clients that are going to be making these requests. So then IO operations occur directly with the OSS and OSTs associated with that file, bypassing the MDS. So for read operations, the data flows directly from the OSTs to the memory on the compute nodes. So each OST and MDT maps to a distinct subset of these read devices. So finally, in the storage, I wanted to talk about archival storage, and we use high-performance storage systems, or HPSS. So this, is, this was again developed in collaboration with five US Department of Energy laboratories. Uh, manages petabytes of data on disk and robotic tape libraries. It's actually, um, there's one across this um, where I work here, and it's a lot of fun to watch how these robotic arms wa um, work. So HPSS provides highly flexible and scalable hierarchical storage management that keeps recently used data on disk and less recently used data on tape. So here's a quick uh, diagram of how HPSS interacts with clusters and other devices. So you have multiple protocols which will work with HPSS. So you have GridFTP, Globus Online, FTP, et cetera, to name a few. And then you have the HPSS movers and you have disks which work in tandem with the core servers and the metadata server that's housed within the HPSS environment. <clears throat> So uh, here's a quick overview about how a HPSS read works. Um, the client issues the read to the core servers, and this happens on the client cluster end. The next thing that happens is that the core server, or the HPSS core server, accesses the metadata that's available. And the backend of the HPSS is actually a DB2 backend. So then the core server commands the movers to stage the file from the tape to the disk. Uh, the mover then does that, and then the core server sends back the lock and the ticket back to the client on the cluster. And finally, the client uh, reads from shared disk over the SAN, or client reads data from the mover itself over the LAN. So that was a quick overview about uh, storage architectures that are commonly prevalent at a HPC environment. So the next thing I wanted to talk was about the infrastructure environment itself. So I wanted to categorize it into three different categories, um, network infrastructure, security infrastructure, and then cluster infrastructure. Some, it's, they're all very tightly coupled together, so, and 
sometimes you hear the terms used in one area in a completely different area, and that's because they all work very well together. So I, I'm going to group together network and cluster infrastructure and tackle security by itself. So within the network and cluster infrastructure, you have the network servers. So there you have DHCP server, which as everybody knows, assigns um, IP addresses to servers in your network. The DNS server, the domain namespace server, which basically is a lookup service that you provide for all your machines in the cluster. Uh, LDAP, which basically is a way to manage your directories and file access on your network. And then your mail server, which is for sending mail, which is actually very, very important when it comes to monitoring and reporting and things like that. Um, and then on the hardware side, you have your network switches and your VLANs. And your VLANs are very important because um, if your physical devices cannot be mounted on the same switch, your VLAN comes in and therefore can logically actually group these devices together. And then you have your schedulers, which are a part of your cluster itself. And these are the ones that dictate how jobs are run and what order they run. They dictate fair share policies, um, things like that. So you can also do enforcements in terms of number of jobs a user can run, a number of jobs a user can submit, number of jobs a project can submit, um, what to do when a project runs out of an allocation, um, different things like that. So there are multiple schedulers around. Here at Nix, we use Torque in conjunction with Moab. You also have PBS Pro. Slurm is an open source product that is very, very popular. Um, so the final thing also was authentication. I'll talk about authentication a little further down in this talk, but I wanted to put that in here as well. Which brings me to operational security to manage this network and cluster. So when you talk about security, there are two big things you want to talk about. One is intrusion prevention systems, and the other is intrusion detection systems. What is the difference between these two? So prevention systems usually sit on the policy side of the house, whereas detection systems are more of a visibility tool. Another way to look at it is prevention systems can actually act on the data they receive whereas detection systems are more of a reporting mechanism for admins to find out what happened and when. Um, so prevention systems actively drop packets of data or disconnect connections that contain unauthorized data. Uh, they dictate which traffic can enter and which cannot. So two basic types of prevention systems as I see it, you have the rate limiting systems and the product that we use here is fail to ban. And fail to ban for those who are not familiar with this product basically it's a set of rules that you can set to say, um, in case there is an IP that tries to brute force, let's say, or let's say there's a user who's trying to brute force into the system. We can say after X amount, X number of attempts, you will block this IP for a certain period of time. So that way, brute force attacks can be restricted. And there's also policy enforcement, such as firewalls and IP tables. And what these usually do is basically say, we will not allow authentication from these certain IP ranges. Um, it dictates traffic flow into the network and also out, out back to the, uh, to the internet. Uh, intrusion detection system. So IDSs, like I said earlier, are basically a visibility tool. They sit to the side of the network, monitoring it for anomalous activity. Um, it also looks for security policy violations and checks for malware, spyware, et cetera. It also checks for unauthorized applications. So a couple of examples here, um, network scans, uh, we use Qualys. So Qualys free scan basically supports a few different scan types like vulnerability checks for hidden malware, SSL issues, and other network related vulnerabilities. And then we have packet analyzers such as Snort. And packet analyzers basically facilitate the capture and visualization of network traffic. Um, an interesting example was that we also use a true tool called Bro, which uh, does, you, it, you can configure several reports to come out of it, but one of the things we do is we try to get a daily report to say what does our traffic look like, what are the, what are the IPs that are hitting us the most, things like that. So one, one day our network engineer just looked at the report and said, wait, this IP looks really different. It's coming from somewhere completely we're not used to. So then um, we actually went back to our uh, packet capture device, which captures all the incoming packets, and then uh, looked at for that particular time frame, and we were able to pinpoint the exact IP which, where it was coming from and what it was hitting, and we were able to block those IPs. So that was a good use of that tool. 
the next um, section I want to talk about are authentication mechanisms. So you have a few different, uh, traditionally we've used passwords and SSH keys, um, but Recently, there's been definitely been a push towards a two-factor or multi-factor authentication. And the nice thing at Nix was that we have used uh, two-factor since the time we started back in 2009. And till date, we have not had a compromise here, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. So uh, multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentic authentication is basically a combination of two things. It's something that you know and something that you have. And interestingly enough, when I was thinking about it, we've actually used two-factor at places outside the cluster environment for a very, very long time. Um, when you think about withdrawing cash from an ATM, let's say, uh, you need to have your debit card or your bank card, which is unique to you. And you also need your PIN, which is also unique to you. So that is something that you have and something that you know. Uh, two-factor authentication is pretty much the same exact thing. So two-factor authentication, there are usually two different ways to do it. One is a hard token, which is like the RSA fob that is there, that's pictured there. And you also have soft tokens, which are more of a recent thing, and that's just a mobile application for smartphones. So you try to log into a resource. Um, it asks you for a password. You type in your password. It goes back to your two-factor server, um, which sends a push to your phone if you've configured a phone for two-factor authentication. Approve, deny the request, and based on that, you either log in or you don't. Uh, for those who don't have smartphones, uh, soft tokens are also available as calls to a landline or a regular phone, uh, though that's probably a little more cumbersome to use. So how does two-factor authentication work? I think I quickly ran through this before. So a user sends the PIN and token code, and this is usually for a hard token, and this is how it works. So a user sends a PIN and a token code. So the PIN is something that I know. The token code is something the... RSA fob actually um, creates. So the, it changes about every 60 seconds, and it's usually a six-digit number. So you take that six-digit number, attach it to your PIN that you've set before, and that is your password. So that is then sent to the two-factor authentication manager, which either approves or denies that, and based on that, your login is either successful or it fails. Soft tokens work the same way, except that instead of the token code, you actually get a push to a push notification on your phone device. So the next thing is accounts and account management. So why do we really need accounts and why do we need to manage these accounts? So the main purpose is for fair share of the machine. Um, they're useful for collaborations between research teams. And um, allocations are also awarded in terms of service units. So service units are basically either in terms of core hours or node hours. For example, uh, most of our nodes here have 16 cores, so a node. So you could either say you have a, you compute in node hours. Some of the machines do that. We charge them in node hours, and some of the machines are just charged by the number of cores they use. Um, allocation process. So how do we do it here at Nix? So a user submits a proposal outlining the work that they're doing and the number of SUs they need to complete that work. Uh, in this proposal, they also add the signs that they're doing, the results they hope to get, what their job profiles look like, how much each job, how long each job is going to run, how many jobs they want to submit, things like that. Um, so then we get this request through an online mechanism, which I will show you in a little bit. And we have a request allocation committee at a rack here which reviews these requests. So once your request is approved, it then goes through an automatic process again, which either creates a new project, if you need a new project, or just adds more time to an existing project if that was your, if you had a renewal request in place. Uh, so these are some screen grabs of our request and account page here at Nix. So the first one is, so I'm just gonna look over to my other monitor here because I can see it a little better. So the first one is, um, where we gather user info. So we say, do you actually have an account at Nix already? Or do you want a new user account here? So I'm going to go through the process where I'm a new user requesting a new project at the center. So I say, OK, I want a new user, and I'm going to request the username TK Samuel. So then when I press continue there, it will make a check to make sure that that name is unique and then go on to the next step. 
So step two is a little more information about myself, um, about where I'm working, the department, things like that. And then after that, I go on to the project choices. So do I want to be added to an existing project? Am I a staff member just requesting access to the, to the site? Or do I want a new project? So in this case, I say I want a new project. So since I requested a new project, the next step was gathering more information about the project itself. So to things like, um, what's the purpose of this project? Is it for training? Is it for education? Is it for open research? Are you an industry partner? Are you a commercial vendor? So the main uh, reason behind wanting to compute with us. Uh, what's the field of science that you're gonna be computing in? What are your funding sources? And then we have three main types of uh, projects we allocate here. So the first one is a standard project, which is for um, well-established research groups. They know what they're doing. Um, they just need hours and they will crank with. So then we have um, pilot awards, which is basically for new users who are not really used to the machine, not used to the environment. It's more of a test run that they're doing to see, well, if this will work well for them, um, if they're getting the scaling that they think they need, things like that. So those are the pilot awards that we do. And then finally, the educational and outreach and training awards, which are used for training, workshops, etc. Um, so based on that, there are requirements that your proposal needs to have, the amount of supporting documentation you need. Um, people usually submit that to us in a PDF or a Word document, and they upload that. So the next step in this process is actually asking for machines, for uh, um, many machines and saying how many hours you need for your particular project. You can also say you just want general login access or you just want storage. Finally, you get an overview summary of your project request. Uh, you also get to read the terms and conditions and user responsibilities for computing at NICS. You say you agree with them and you submit your request. So that's kind of a quick walkthrough of what it looks like, what kind of details you need to submit a project request here. So then a little bit more about reporting. Um, so two main types of reporting, as I said earlier. One is reporting to users. Users want to know what projects they're on, how much time they've used, how much time they've left. Um, just they want to keep an overview of what their usage on our machines and systems look like. So we have a Nix user portal, which provides this information to them. We try to make it a one-stop shop where they can do a few self-service tasks and also just view a lot of information about, what, about their projects and allocations. So this is the user profile. This is my user profile on the Nix portal. So it has my information. It has all the projects that are allocated to me. It also shows me what my default project is because usually uh, when you submit a job, if you don't if you don't explicitly reference a particular project, it'll just charge your default project. Um, so we give users the ability to change their default projects if they choose to do so. Um, we show them all the DNs that are associated with their username. Uh, we show them their login information and we also show it for the past 30 days so that they can review their information from time to time to make sure that um, no malicious attacks are happening from their end. Um, we also show them the mailing list that they belong to and they have the ability to opt in or opt out of those mailing lists. Uh, the next one we have is a little more information from a project perspective. So for PIs, this is very useful information. They'd like to know who are the people who are working on their project, um, which user has burned how many hours, what are the allocations that are active, which ones have expired, uh, things like that. So we have as you see, you have active users on a project, you have users no longer on a project um, account. So that just shows you a quick breakdown of the different machines that we have, um, how many hours were allocated for the particular machine, how many are remaining, and when those accounts expired. And then we also have a little bit of usage details. So the user usage basically is just um, number of hours used per user on that project. Because we have actually run into cases where a single user burns up 85, 90% of an allocation without the knowledge of the PI. And then the PI comes back and is a little more than surprised saying, what just happened here? I would like more time. So then we provided this option for PIs to be able to actually keep an eye on what their users are doing. Uh, we also have storage details as far as NFS and HBSI scope. 
so what do reports for administrators look like? There are a lot of reports that administrators look for. So some, some of the main level things are um, overall view of project usage, because when we want to allocate hours for future projects, we need to know what current projects are doing. Just because they ask for 500,000 hours sometimes does not mean they're actually going to use those 500,000 hours. And they also don't really use it on an average based on scale. Usually we see that projects burn a lot more hours towards the end of their allocation than at the beginning of their allocations. So when we are um, making new requests, we need to factor all of these things uh, into our decisions. So that's one of the big reports we look at is hours, how many hours are allocated, how many total hours have been used for the machine. And if current projects need to actually finish out their project allocation, what are the burn rates that they're going to require? Uh, some other reports that we find interesting are the job profile or job mix reports. Uh, these are these reports basically bin jobs in terms of the core counts they request in terms of the wall clock time they use um, and things like that. So what this lets us see is um, are there any jobs that are is there any certain subset of jobs that are bigger than other jobs? Uh, do we need to move the scheduler in a way that accommodates for these jobs? Because a lot of times you see even if you have a cluster that's 900 nodes, a thousand nodes, let's say. Sometimes your biggest users are going to be single node jobs. So in those cases, what we do is we just set up a debug queue or a small job queue where one, two node jobs can just quickly run through. So job profile, job mix reports really help us in order to make these kind of decisions. Uh, the next thing is queue wait time reports. And this was actually came out of a necessity as well because we started getting a lot of tickets from users in a certain job profile saying, hey, we're not getting through the system in time. We've been waiting days, weeks sometimes, and we just can't get through. So then we created these reports to say, is this really happening in our systems? And we actually found a certain um, job profile that was get eclipsed by both smaller and larger jobs. And we had to take measures that would prevent that from happening in the future. Uh, the next thing were file system usage reports. And since Luster is a shared file system, there are no quotas on it. Uh, what happens is it's ripe for abuse right there. Uh, large users sometimes can just dump terabytes of data and without really moving it off to archival storage or elsewhere. So file system usage reports help us keep an eye on usage of our Luster file system. And finally, downtime metrics. So these are useful for two different things. One is reporting back to our funding agencies to tell, tell them, okay, these are uptimes, because that's one of the SLAs that we have is, what are the uptimes on the machine? How many times do you t did you have to bring the machine down for uh, bringing nodes back in or upgrades or anything else? So downtime metrics are very, very useful for that. And they're also useful for future planning because sometimes you can still run a cluster even when nodes are down, you just take it out of, um, out of scheduling and you let the rest of the nodes run. So if you're just taking downtime a couple of weeks ago and the cluster is still fine, it's just a couple of nodes, you just try to keep going on till for another month or so to, when you can put it back in. Okay, so the next thing I wanna talk about is monitoring with a focus on Nagios. And Nagios is the tool that we use for most of our monitoring. Um, the network is something uh, is something that has to be heavily monitored. And our clusters, all our infrastructure systems, we use Nagios to monitor all of it. So Nagios has five different aspects to it. So the first thing is monitoring itself, where admins can configure Nagios to monitor critical IT infrastructure components including uh, system metrics, network protocols, applications, servers, and network infrastructure. So the checks could be as simple as, is the service up? Is the server up? Um, what is the latency? Things like that. So that's where the monitoring aspect is. So right after the monitoring, you come to the alerting. So when the check fails or when the check um, does not meet expected requirements, now you sends an alert when critical infrastructure components fail. So it provides administrators with the notice of important alerts. So usually you can, it either can deliver via email or SMS. And these Nagios alerts usually go to the um, operators of the machine room who then can then uh, try to talk to either the primary or the secondary system administrator in charge of that particular service. So the third part is response. 
Um, so admins can acknowledge alerts and begin resolving outages and investigating security alerts. So the nice thing about that is that if um, a particular if the particular outage is not getting responded to by Nagios, Nagios has the ability to escalate it to the uh, next higher up admin for that particular service. So this ensures that the service is actually looked at and outage is actually looked at when failure occurs. Uh, the next one is reporting. So reports provide a historical record of outages, events, notifications, and alert response for later review. So availability reports also help ensure, like I said earlier, that SLAs are being met. Uh, finally, planning. So trending and capacity planning graphs and reports allow you to identify necessary infrastructure upgrades before failures occur. So if you see a particular service is failing a lot more now than it used to before, that's telling you something that you probably want to upgrade before it completely um, goes down on you. So the last thing like I wanted to touch base on was configuration management. And usually when you talk about configuration management, you talk about a cattle versus pets mentality. Uh, very often, um, system administrators like to treat um, servers, clusters as pets as special snowflakes that need to be tended to by themselves. And if one goes down, then um, all hell breaks loose pretty much. But that's not what we really want when you talk about a large cluster environment. Um, when you have about 700, 800 compute nodes, you have about five to 10 login nodes, 20 to 40 infrastructure servers. You do not want to treat each server as a special snowflake. And that's why you wanted to have this herd or cattle mentality when it comes to um, creating a HPC environment. Um, what I mean by cattle mentality is one, in a herd of about 100, 500 cattle, one cattle goes down, it's not gonna affect the entire process a lot. Uh, your productivity is gonna remain about the same. You just get another cattle and you're good to go. So that's the kind of mentality that you want to get towards when you're managing a HPC environment. So why configuration management altogether? There are three main reasons. First is the cost that are associated with um, maintaining a HPC environment. So even if your software is free, even if you're getting uh, servers, et cetera, at a cheaper price, the cost of maintaining, upgrading, uh, deploying is still fairly high. And you want to keep those costs to a minimum as much as possible. And one of the best ways to do that is deploy configuration management on your servers. The next thing is a lack of integration between software tools. So like we've talked about a few tools so far. So we've talked about Nagios, um, and now I'm going to talk about Puppet, which is a configuration management tool. You have all your reporting tools, you have your network scanning tools, etc. A lot of these tools really don't really sync well with each other. So you need this glue that is configuration management to hold these pieces well together. So again, the third thing is that the size of clusters vary widely. If you're having a one node or two node cluster, it's easy to maintain these clusters on a node by node basis. But when you're moving to a thousand node, 5,000, 10,000 node cluster, that's almost impossible to do. So you want a centralized way of managing these nodes. And again, that's where configuration management comes in. So we use Puppet for configuration management here. And these are, so we, it's based on an agent master architecture. So any of the nodes or servers that need to be managed by Puppet has a Puppet agent running on it. And then you have a Puppet master where you have all the configurations for all these nodes. And when I say all, I really do mean all. So we have SSH protocols, how they're configured, who can access these, uh, who can log into these machines, how's LDAP set up, um, what are the software packages available, how, everything. So all of that is basically on one node that's called the master node. And when you make changes, you only make it in the master node, and then you have a puppet agent that runs periodically. On our systems, we've configured it for about 30 minutes. So every 30 minutes, the agent nodes, uh, sorry, the agent, the puppet agent on the nodes that are managed by puppet run and pull any changes required back onto the managed nodes. So a couple of the principles, when we talk about Puppet, these are a couple of the principles that come across. So the first one is principle of least privilege. So an agent master Puppet, each agent only gets its own configuration and it's unable to see how the other nodes are configured. So that is good for isolating uh, LDAP server from a DNS server, et cetera. 
So the next one is just as I mentioned, the ease of centralized reporting and uh, inventory. Agents send reports to the Puppet Master by default, and the master can be configured with any number of report handlers to pass these on to on other services. So let's say there's a misconfig in a Puppet file. So what happens is that the agent sends this uh, alert back saying, there was a misconfig here, I cannot run this config, or I cannot install this config right now. And that gets sent back to a system administrator either via email, pretty much via email. Um, or it's also logged. The next one is ease of updating configurations. So like I said earlier, only one, only the Puppet Master has the Puppet modules, the main manifest, and all the other data necessary for compiling these catalogs. Um, this means when you need to update your system's configuration, you only need to update content on one node. Which leads me to my next point. CPU and memory usage on managed machines is conserved. Now, since you're not using your managed nodes to compile and um, um, have software. Everything is actually just based on your master nodes, and therefore you have your CPU and memory that's conserved on your managed nodes. Um, the next one is a need for, so all of this pretty much brings down to the point of we need a dedicated master server. And this, as you can see, probably needs to be a fairly beefy machine. Uh, so Another main requirement for running Puppet is you need good network connectivity because you have only one places where all changes are made and the agents just pull these changes from this master node. So you need good network connectivity between all your managed nodes and the Puppet master. And finally, how does security work here? So agents and the master node uses HTTPS to secure their communications and authenticate each other. And uh, systems also require an SSL certificate installed. So my, the final thing that I wanted to talk about were other software tools used for managing a HPC environment. So we've talked about Nagios a little bit, where you have continuous monitoring for a HPC environment. Uh, the next one is a package repository management and continuous integration. Um, why do you need a package repository management system? So in a system such as ours, for example, we have multiple compilers, different versions of these compilers, and a lot of the software needs to be compiled across the entire spectrum of these compilers. So very quickly, it can get terribly out of hand. So you have something called a package repository management system, such as the one we use here is called Jenkins, which can not only compile uh, software against different compilers, et cetera, it can also run regression tests against all of these new compiled pieces of software and store that information. So we both have historical data and we can actually install a larger number of pieces of software than we would be able to do if we did it all manually. Uh, the third thing is ticket tracking. So how, how does communication happen within all these different pieces and different groups in our HPC environment? You could use email, but email can either be lost or ignored. So that's why we come and that's why we use tickets. So we use tickets for talking to our users. Um, we use tickets for talking between our groups and within our groups as well. Uh, we here at Nix use Request Tracker or RT. There's also Bugzilla. And Footprints, I think, is another good uh, ticket tool. Uh, the next thing is something no one, and no, at least no system administrator ever wants to talk about, and that's documentation. Uh, but documentation is extremely important, especially when you have people, different system administrators working on the same piece of um, hardware, um, things like that. So what we use here is Docker Wiki. Um, the next thing is provisioning. And provisioning is basically when you bring up a cluster or a node for the first time. What is the OS that you want on it? How does it get its um, IP address, et cetera, et cetera? So we use Kickstart for provisioning our systems. Um, configuration management, as I just talked about, a couple of the other um, examples out there are Chef, uh, Salt, Ansible, and finally, backup software. So we do backup our home areas um, and, of course, all our infrastructure uh, software, all our configurations, all of that is backup, and we use backup PC for backups here. And that's actually the end of my talk, so I'm good for questions.